The world was young, the mountains green. No stain yet on the moon was seen. No word was laid on stream or stone when Durin woke and walked alone. He named the nameless hills and dells. He drank from yet untasted wells. He stooped and looked in the mirror mirror and saw a crown of stars appear as gems upon a silver thread above the shadow of his head. The world was fair, the mountains tall, in elder days, before the fall of mighty kings in Nargothrond and Gondolin, who, now beyond the western seas, have passed away. The world was fair in Durin's day. A king he was, on carven throne, in many pillared halls of stone, with golden roof and silver floor, and runes of power upon the door. The light of sun and stars and moon in shining lamps of crystal hewn, undimmed by cloud or shade of night, there shone forever fair and bright. Their hammer on the anvil smote, their chisel clove and graver wrote, their forged was blade and bound was hilt, the delver mined, the mason built. Their beryl and pearl and opal pale and metal wrought like fish's mail, buckler and corslet, axe and sword and shining spears were laid in hoard. Unwearied then were Durin's folk, beneath the mountains music woke, the harpers harped, the minstrel sang, and at the gates the trumpets rang. The world is grey, the mountains old. The forge's fire is ashen cold. No harp is rung, no hammer falls. The darkness dwells in Durin's halls. The shadow lies upon his tomb in Moria, in khazad But still the sunken stars appear in dark and windless mirror there lies his crown in water deep, till Durin wakes again from sleep. Lieutenant Morant shot no prisoners before the death of Captain Hunt. He then changed a good deal and adopted the sternest possible measures against the enemy. Yet there is no evidence to suggest that Lieutenant Morant has an intrinsically barbarous nature. On the contrary, the fact of the matter is war changes men's natures. The barbarities of war are seldom committed by abnormal men. The tragedy of war is these horrors are committed by normal men in abnormal situations. Situations where the ebb and flow of everyday life have departed and have been replaced by a constant round of fear and anger, blood and death. Soldiers at war are not to be judged by civilian rules, even if they commit acts which, calmly viewed afterwards, can only be seen as unchristian and brutal. And if, in every war, particularly guerrilla war, all the men who committed reprisals were to be charged and tried as murderers, court martials like this one would be in permanent session. Would they not? I say, we cannot hope to judge such matters unless we ourselves have been submitted to the same pressures, the same provocations as these men whose actions are on trial. was brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. 
all Mimsy where the borough goes and the Momraths upgrade. Beware the Jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the Jup-Jup bird and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand, long time the manxome foe he sought. So rested he by a tum-tum tree and stood a while in thought. And as in offish thought he stood, the Jabberwock, with eyes of flame, came whiffling through the tulgy wood and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through the vorpal blade went snicker-snack. He left it dead, and with its head he went galumphing back. Oh, hast thou slain the Jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy, or Rabjus day, kalu kale, he chortled in his joy. It was brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borough goves, and the momraths upgrabe. But, a gentleman of the jury, there are many kinds of silence. Consider first the silence of a man when he is dead. Let us say we go into the room where he is lying, and let us say it is the dead of night. There is nothing like darkness for sharpening the ear, and we listen. What do we hear? Silence. What does it betoken? The silence? Nothing. This is silence pure and simple. But consider another case. Suppose I were to draw a dagger from my sleeve and make to kill the prisoner here with it. And their lordships there, instead of crying out for me to stop, or crying out for help to stop me, maintain their silence. That would betoken. It would betoken a willingness that I should do it, and, under the law, they would be guilty with me. So silence can, according to circumstances, speak. Consider now the circumstances of the prisoner's silence. The oath was put to good and faithful subjects up and down the country, and they had declared his grace's title to be just and good. Yet when it came to the prisoner here, he refused. He caused this silence. Yet, is there a man in this court, is there a man in this country, who does not know Sir Thomas More's opinion of the title? I think not. But how can that be? Because this silence betokened, nay, this silence was not silence at all, but most eloquent denial. Oh, she misused me past the endurance of a block, an oak, but with one green leaf on it would have answered her. My very visor began to assume life and scold with her. She told me, not thinking that I had been myself, that I was the princess jester, that I was duller than a great Thor, huddling jest upon jest with such impossible conveyance upon me that I stood like a man at a mark with a whole army shooting at me. She speaks poniards, and every word stabs. If her breath were as terrible as her terminations, there were no living near her, she would infect to the North Star. I would not marry her, though she were endowed with all that Adam had left him before he transgressed. She would have made Hercules have turned spit, yea, and have cleft his club to make the fire too. Come, talk not of her. 
you shall find her the infernal eighty in good apparel. I would to God some scholar would conjure her, for certainly, while she is here, a man may live as quiet in hell as in a sanctuary, and people sin upon purpose because they would go thither. So indeed, all disquiet, horror, and perturbation follow her. Meine Tochter, oh mein Kind, meine Tochter floh mit dem Ketten, diesen wüsten Frauenheld. Blast, Winter, sprengt die Backen, wütet, blast, ihr Katarakt und Wolkenbrüche, schweigt, bis ihr die Türme seucht und Wetterherrn ertränkt. Ihr Schwäglingen, Gedanken, schnellen Blitze, schlagt flach das mächtige Rund der Welt, zerbrecht die Formen der Natur, vernichtet den Keim des undankbaren Menschen. Ich bin ein Vater, an dem man mehr gesündigt, als er selbst sündigte. Signor Antonio, many a time and oft in the Rialto you have rated me about my monies and my usances. Still have I borne it with a patient shrug, for sufferance is the badge of all our tribe. You call me misbeliever, cutthroat dog, and spit upon my Jewish gabardine and all for use of that which is mine own. Well then, it now appears you need my help. Go to then, you come to me and you say, Shylock, uh, we would have monies. You say so. You that did void your room upon my beard and put me as you spurn a stranger cur over your threshold. Monies is your suit. What should I say to you? Should I not say, half a dog money? Is it possible a cur can lend three thousand ducats? Or should I bend low into a bondsman's key with bated breath and whispering humbleness say this? Uh, fair sir, you spit on me on Wednesday last. You spurned me such a day. Another time you called me dog. And for these courtesies, I'll lend you thus much monies.